you'd like to follow along in your Bibles today, we're going to be in two places, primarily 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning with verse 12. 1 Corinthians 15, 12, Luke 24, verse 1. That's really more of a reference. I hope you pray for your pastor. I have to be careful on days like today that I'm not preaching my excitement of what I understand about the resurrection, but that I'm preaching what God needs me to preach. I was texting with the general superintendent this morning, just uh, said, I'm praying for you. I recognize the magnitude of what this day represents and the privilege it is to be in the pulpit today. And it's very overwhelming. So I hope you pray for me. Because Resurrection Day is not... It's unlike any other Sunday or day that it represents. It represents victory over sin and death. But when you understand what that really means to God and to you, then I pray too that you would be overwhelmed by what it means. So I hope you prayed for me. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning with verse 12, says, Now, if Christ be preached that He rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all, we are of all men most miserable. But now, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruit, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule in all authority and power. For he must reign, so he has put all enemies under his feet. And finally, verse 26, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Wow, I can't tell you how many times I read through these verses of Scripture. This portion where we begin reading in verse 12 starts by introducing really a contradictory idea from those among the Apostle Paul, who God used as the instrument to pin these words, and who had preached that Christ had risen from the dead. These contradictory ideas come from those who were among him. And yet, at the very same time, they argued that there was no resurrection of the dead. They would say, Christ is risen from the dead, but there is no resurrection of the dead. Speaking of others, Adam Clark, who is a British theologian and biblical scholar, well known for his commentary on the Bible that took him over 40 years to compile, which is just completely amazing to me because I'm just over the age of 40. To think that my entire life this man spent his commentary on the Bible. He simplified this idea that we're speaking of in the first part of 1 Corinthians 15 with these words I'd like you to hear. 
There seem to have been some at Corinth who, though they denied the resurrection of the dead, admitted that Christ had risen again. You see how that's contradictory. The Apostles' argument goes, therefore, to state that if Christ was raised from the dead, mankind may be raised. If mankind cannot be raised from the dead, then the body of Christ was never raised. It doesn't make sense. Now listen, there are, I believe, two events in human history that I think should be the most celebrated by all of all of mankind. Every man, woman, and child that has ever walked this, walked this earth, if I could present these ideas to them, I would say there are two significant events in human history that are most important to you that you should listen and agree with this. The birth of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Two things that happened in human history, I believe, are the most significant. And the reason for this is because of what these two things mean, what they mean both to God and to you. God's greatest desire for you and for me for all of eternity is to love Him. And I know we've said that before, but hear it again for the first time like you've never heard it. God's greatest desire for you and for all men out in this world is for you to love Him. To eventually come to a place in your life where you say, Lord, I do not want to be on, the, on my own throne. I am not qualified to be Lord of my life and King of my life. I make a mess of things when I try to do this on my own. God wants you to come to that conclusion. And He wants you to say, I will instead rather live for you and make you Lord and King of my life. That's all God wants. That's it. For all of eternity, now and for all of eternity. It's all He's ever communicated throughout the entire Bible that there was one theme. And it's always interesting to me to to think how God simplifies this truth so, so much. God's truth is so simple. He simplifies it by one theme. If we could pick out of all, the, if we could summarize all 66 books of the Bible, it's about God revealing Himself to man in His great desire to love you and to be loved in return. That's what He's communicating. Yeah, there's more to it. But that's the thing, if you will. And so if this is really true, and I challenge you to consider if this is really true, and pray to God, is, this, is that really true? Is that what you want and need? And I want you to again consider those two of them. The birth of Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. And know this in your heart, that without those two things happening, God's love towards you and any love that you might have towards Him, it's, it's not possible. It's not possible. The birth of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it's not possible for you to be in a relationship with God if those two things do not happen. If Jesus is not born, there is no Savior. If Jesus is not resurrected from the dead, then God's attempt to save you for your sins and from your sins has failed. If Jesus is not resurrected. So listen, both are necessary for God to have what He wants, and both are vital to our understanding of God's great love for you and for me and for all the world. God just needs us to give them a chance. And if we do, we will hopefully see the things maybe we have never seen before. Especially on Resurrection Sunday. This day represents the pinnacle of life. It represents the exact definition of selflessness. And among other things, it represents victory over death, both for God 
in for you. It's victory. It represents victory over sin and death. And so far, I'd like for us to kind of hone in for just a few moments on a couple of the texts that we've already read. And I want to look at them a little more closely. That we read in our primary text. Look again at verse 14. If you're still there in 1 Corinthians 15. It says, And if Christ be not risen, and our preaching is vain, and your faith is also vain. So listen to this for just a moment. If Christ is not risen, that is, Jesus Christ has died. He has been crucified. He was sealed away in that tomb. And then as the Bible says in Luke 24, 1 through 6, He was risen from the dead. 24, Luke 24, verse 1. I want to read you a portion of Scripture. And you can turn there if you want or just listen. Luke 24, 1 says, Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. He was dead, physically. And they put him in this tomb, in the sepulcher, and they knew he was they knew they put him there, but he wasn't there. And it came to pass as they were much perplexed thereabout. Behold, two men stood by them in shining garments, and as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. In all four gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you will find God testifying of Jesus' resurrection. And we are only reading this one account in Luke simply for context to see what happened on that day he rose. But in 1 Corinthians 15, we are dealing with an argument or a contention against this type of Holy Scripture. The dead do not rise. And if the dead do not rise, then Jesus Christ is not risen. You see, we have God professing one thing. Jesus has been risen from the dead. And we have some who say, whoever those some are, is no way. This has to be our logical conclusion. If the dead do not rise, then Christ does not rise. So I want to ask you all for the question. Why does God use this possible in this chapter to make such an earnest plea that it's this false doctrine? The dead do not love it. Without saying, wait a minute, oh yes they do. Yes they do. And yes they can. Listen, this is why it's so vital that we understand Jesus has risen. Look what he says now. First Corinthians 15. If Christ is not risen, then guess what? Our preaching, then it is our preaching vain. It's vain. And your faith is also vain. That word vain means empty. It means worthless. It means futile. Good for nothing. Useless. With no value. If Jesus is not risen, your faith is in vain. It's worthless. The preaching, why I get in this pulpit and preach, or any man of God who gets in the pulpit and preaches, it's worthless. Why do it? That's what God's saying. There's no point to it. If Christ is not risen, God is presenting the question to all who will listen. Why do you preach anything about Christianity? Why do you do it? If he is not risen, your faith, Christianity, what you believe in is vain. It means absolutely nothing. I want you to hear these words because they're so powerful when you understand what God is speaking of. So think about this for a minute. And this is something I believe God was giving me as I was thinking about, wow, this, the importance of this resurrection. 
It's so important to God. It was necessary. It was vital. It had to happen. But it got me thinking about something else, about God and Jesus Christ. Think about this for a moment. All the things that you have ever learned about God, all the things throughout your life you've ever learned about Jesus, maybe it's a lot, maybe it's a little, but I believe something you've heard of Jesus Christ in God. Maybe you've even believed something. But all that is true, you have to love God. Think about all that you have done. That's the premise I'm today. Think about all that you know about God. Jesus, for example, was and is the only Son of God. He was born of a virgin named Mary, conceived by the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Creed, all those fundamental truths that we talked about. He lived a perfect life. He preached and he shared God's truth to all who would listen. He loved all that he encountered, even harshly at times. And how quickly do we think of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Listen, he loved them too. But I want you to think of all that you know. Being betrayed by his own people, tortured, eventually killed, but hanging on a cross for sins and crimes he did not commit. So listen, to some degree, and there's much more to speak of, but not for today. But to some degree, you've heard all about this. But listen to what God is sharing with us today. If Christ is not risen, if Christ is not risen, then your preaching is vain. Your faith is also in vain. All that you know, all that you believe, all that you have learned about God and Jesus Christ is worthless. All of those things, if Christ is not risen, it's just an amazing thought to me. All those things really happen. But if Christ is not risen, it's in vain. It's meaningless. If Jesus doesn't rise, that's what God is saying. It's all in vain. If we don't understand the resurrection. So why is this the case? How is it all possible? Because it all speaks to its absolute vitality and necessity of Jesus being risen. It's a vital a necessary part of Christianity. And I think too many people today don't understand. Yeah, we, we talk about Resurrection Day. We talk about Easter Sunday and how important that is. Well, why is it important? Why was it necessary for God that Jesus rose? Why is it vital to your salvation that He rose from the dead? And if He didn't, that it's all meaningless. Why does God communicate that? Who of us here today wants to believe our life is meaningless? I don't want to believe that. Even if you don't love God with all of your heart, which you should, God is pleading and begging you to do it. But even if you don't, I assume you at least want some meaning to your life. I want to do some good in the world. I want to serve others. I want to raise my kids and my children to do good and be respectful. You want some sort of meaning, do we not? Don't all people want that? I believe everyone wants meaning. But listen, without Jesus Christ in your life, without Him, and without Him being raised, without the resurrection, resurrection Sunday, and without what many celebrate on Easter Sunday, listen, life is vain. It's vain. It's worthless. It doesn't matter if you're not a Christian today. If Jesus is not raised, then life is worthless. It doesn't matter. We have to see the vitality and the necessity of the fact that He is risen. And so now it finally begs the question, why? You keep saying, why, preacher? Why is it so important? It begs the question, why is it so vital? to God and to Christianity. I'd like, to, uh, like for us to look once again at our Scripture that we've already read. A couple of verses to simplify this idea. Look back at 1 Corinthians 15, 17, 18. Just think of that simple question. Why is, why is the resurrection necessary? 
Why did this have to happen? Why did God express this so clearly? Look at verse 17. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. Listen, at the beginning of our message, I spoke of what I believe to be two of the most important events, the two most important events celebrated, should be celebrated in human history. The birth of Christ and the resurrection of Christ. But there's an element involved in speaking of these things I deliberately left thought that I want to share with you now. And in the end, simply just can't be left out of the equation. It's found in verse 17. If Christ be not raised, you are yet in your sins. You are yet in your sins if Christ is not risen again. I've thought of this idea before. What does it mean to people when they are told that they are sinful people? What does that communicate to you? What does it mean to you? That they were born in sin. Sin, in the original Greek language, the word hamartia, means offense. An offense. Having sin in your life or being a sinful people means you are an offense to God. This truth, this reality for all men is never easy to receive. But it's true. It's never something that brings joy or pleasure to your life. But it's true. To hear that you are an offense to anyone, it's hard to receive. But especially to God. God, I'm an offense to you. But listen, this is what sin has done. This is the reality that God had to deal with. And by the mere fact of your birth, you are born an offense to God, and therefore you are condemned to eternal separation from God. Lord, help me receive that. That's a hard thing to swallow. And people receive it differently. But listen, we saw this twice in our main text. Look at verses 21 and 22. For since by man came death, See, instigated by man for all of you. Then, verse 22, For as in Adam all die, the forefather of all of us, Adam, passed spiritual death unto all men. This is the human condition, the human experience, sinful beings with no hope of anything beyond this life. And by the grace of God, and because of His goodness, and because what Jesus Christ did, we see and experience some wonderful things on this earth. We, we do. We see wonderful things because of God and what He has done. But listen, without the resurrection, this is all there is. All that you see and experience every day the human condition, apart from God. All the sin and all the ways that it's affected this world. That's all we see. That's all we have. That is our best experience. That's all there is to this life. God said it best. Look at verse 19. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all of men most miserable. Just this life. Is it? All the pain. Some of you have been through some pain. Some misery. Some heartache. Is this all we have? A sinful world is our best experience. Misery and pain comes to all of us in our family. But is this the best we can hope for? And in the end, death is all we have to look forward to. You know what God's saying about that? How miserable. How miserable. 
Uh uh-uh. But because of Jesus Christ, life is more than that. Life is more than misery on earth with no hope. Life on this earth can be joyful. It can be peaceful. It can be comforting despite the, all that sin that surrounds us. Do you know why? Because He is risen. The resurrection means that Jesus Christ overcame sin and death. That is what this day represents. Sin is defeated. Death is defeated. If Jesus did not rise up from the grave and overcome death, then as the Scripture says, you are yet in your sin. And what a miserable, terrible, awful experience that would be. Can God bring this reality to your mind and to your heart today? What a miserable experience if Christ is not risen. The resurrection says, it screams. It screams, really, is what it does. It says, the plan of human salvation, through Jesus Christ, it works. It works. There is hope. There is life to be found in Jesus Christ because of the fact that He was resurrected. And I pray, I pray that God would help us to understand why this is so vital and necessary for you and for me. Jesus paid it all. He was born, He lived, He went to that miserable cross. He took on the pain and suffering of your sins and my sins, not because He had to, but because He chose to. Because He knew what it meant for God and He knew what it meant for all. For fallen humanity. God did, God did that. Jesus Christ did that for you. So listen, if you hear nothing else today in this message, can you please hear this? If I've lost you at any point, please hear this. Jesus paid the ultimate price for all of your sins and mine, and for all of the world. Jesus did that. And you also need to know that you didn't deserve it. You didn't deserve it. You didn't earn it. You did nothing good in God's eyes to be worthy of what Jesus Christ did for you. And yet He did it. Because God loved you, because Jesus loved you, He took on that penalty of sin. And boy, was it costly. Boy, was it costly. Each and every day you reject Jesus Christ. And I say this in in great love. Each and every day anyone rejects Jesus Christ is a slap in the face of what God has provided. It really is. I know it sounds harsh, but listen, hear my heart in that statement. When you understand what Jesus did, and all that He went through, all that He suffered, all of those sins that He bore, yours included, and then all that He followed through with on the cross. When you understand that, I believe you agree with that statement. If you are a Christian this morning, you agree with that statement. It's a slap in the face to God and to Jesus Christ when you reject Him, if you understand all that He provided for you and for me. Jesus Then Jesus lived. And then Jesus died. Not just physically, but spiritually. The perfect human, the sinless man, became sin for you and me. I don't deserve it. I didn't 
didn't deserve it. Quick to tell God and anybody who would listen, I did not deserve it. How could we ever thank Him? You know, there's one way, one way you can thank God today for what He did for Jesus Christ. One way. Do you know what that way is? There's one thing you can do for God to say, Thank you, Lord, for what you did for me. You know what that one, one thing is? Giving Him everything. Surrendering all. Giving Him everything. Taking off your throne. Giving it to Him. Everything to Him. You know why? Because God knows what He is. God knows what He's doing. He knows what you need. And you can truly celebrate Resurrection Day, knowing for sure that Jesus was risen. And you can have real life and not see that. What a wonderful day that is for you when you come to that realization. And the last text I'm going to share with you before we leave, we read it, and I'm going to read it again. Verse 26. And 1 Corinthians 15 says this, The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Victory over sin and death. Jesus rose. And because He rose, God is shouting to all of us today, this way. You can be right with me. So I ask all of you, Resurrection Sunday, what are you celebrating? What are you rejoicing in today? Family, friends, fellowship, those are all wonderful things. I hope you're having an opportunity to rest and to share things with family and friends. Hi. But you can celebrate the best thing. Life. And Jesus Christ, because He rose, rejoicing that He defeated sin and resides in us. You can celebrate that. The Scripture says He is not here, but He is risen. Jesus is risen indeed. Amen. I pray that you believe. Brad, Mark, and Sandy, please. Please stand and sing our last hymn, 108. One zero Tell God and anybody who will listen, I did not deserve Jesus Christ. How could we ever thank Him? You know, there's one way, one way you can thank God today for what He did through Jesus Christ. One.
one way. Do you know what that way is? There's one thing you can do for God to say thank you, Lord, for what you did for me. You know what that one, one thing is? Giving him Surrendering all. Giving him everything. Taking off your throne. Giving it to him. Everything to him. You know why? Because God knows what's best. And God knows what is good. He knows what you need. And you can truly celebrate Resurrection Day, knowing for sure that Jesus was risen. And you can have real life and not see that. What a wonderful day that is for you when you come to that realization. And the last text I'm going to share with you before we leave, we read it, and I'm going to read it again. Verse 26 in 1 Corinthians 15 says this, The last enemy that shall be destroyed. Victory over sin and death. Jesus rose. And because He rose, God is shouting to all of us today this way. You can be right with me. So I ask all of you, Resurrection Sunday, what are you celebrating? What are you rejoicing in today? Family, friends, fellowship, those are all wonderful things. I hope you're having an opportunity to rest and to share things with family and friends. Time. But you can celebrate the best thing. Life in Jesus Christ because He rose. Rejoicing that He defeated sin and resides in us. You can celebrate that. The Scripture says He is not here, but He is risen. Jesus is risen. Amen. I pray that you believe it. Brad, Mark, let's sing it.